the uh, presenter of the second paper is Felipe Modesto, from all the way from University of Ottawa, Canada. And his presentation will be on utility gradient implicit cash coordination policy for information-centric and off vehicular networks. And um, video crew is going to give you a signal when you can begin. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my presentation. First of all, I'd like to apologize if I mumble in any way. I'm severely jet lagged. I just got here yesterday. And uh, so this work has been done by me and my professor, Steve Cash. And it follows the utility grading implicit cash coordination policy for information centric ad hoc radio networks. Uh, we'll introduce a brief contextualization uh, of our work uh, as it relates to our research. And then we'll present the proposed cash and algorithm that we have for our work. We'll then have a series of evaluations, both numerical and simulation based. And then we have some conclusions from the results that we have obtained. Now, uh, these are networks, as presented by the first keynote uh, presenter of the morning and by my the previous presenter, have significant limitations to them. Uh, so we have a dichotomy. We have increasing storage and processing capabilities in vehicles. We have increased sensor deployment uh, from uh, image sensors to speed sensors, to proximity sensors, to all different kinds of technologies that are being added to vehicles and that generate knowledge that can be shared within a local vehicle network. And uh, all these applications, they are uh, increasing in variety. So we have applications that are not only from uh, safety systems and passenger comfort systems, but now that have started to be developed in terms of infotainment systems. And uh, this means that we have an increased proliferation of network services. And although we have this increased uh, demand for services and increased variety of services, unfortunately we have very limited network resources. And of course, the uh, widespread increase in service availability does increase uh, bandwidth demands. And coupled with high mobility, which leads to intermittent connectivity, especially if you consider uh, that vehicles do not travel only in urban environments, but in regions where there's uh, not a lot of connectivity to infrastructure. And uh, more than that, uh, we have limit, uh, certain inefficiency in terms of the physical addressing solutions. So host-to-host uh, -host connectivity does not cope with it very well with mobility. And while there are adaptations, it's still not the perfect hit. It was not designed for this purpose. Now, uh, an alternative that is very promising and that has appeared in the last few years is information-centric networking. Uh, ICN, for short, is a concept in which we shift from physical location or post-to-post -post communication to a uh, information or content-centric paradigm. What does that mean? Well, that means that uh, all communication is it's done for based on uh, name data. So all objects within the network are universally recognizable uh, names. And because of this, it doesn't unnecessarily relate to a specific location or rather to the content, which means that uh, we, it's mobility friendly. Also because there's consistent naming, uh, we have improving caching in terms of how caching can be implemented in the network. Uh, specifically with a lot more opportunities in terms of in-network caching. And you also have uh, improved content provisioning as a consequence of that, as you have more potential content providers. The available and even intermediate nodes acting as potential content providers. And uh, given a, surface, uh, a service uh, class, you might even have multiple uh, objects that can serve it. So let's say you're looking for traffic information that doesn't necessarily come from a specific service provider or public transfer system. That can come from the perception that your neighbors have in the network from other vehicles that are in a specific location of interest. And uh, for this work, we considered uh, content-centric networking, more specifically, we considered name data networking as the solution that we're working on. And uh, we considered the hierarchical prefix-based naming scheme as the model that we are following. And uh, we considered this to be applied up on the IEEE 802.11b ESRC standard uh, it, because of the 
um, North American transportation uh, mandate on the implementation of the system. This is has significant track to it. Um, and although uh, 5G technologies, for example, are an alternative, we consider them to be a limited option as first, they have not been fully implemented, and second, uh, the costs associated with uh, infrastructure communication are relatively high. Though, of course, ad hoc communication between 5G devices can also be an alternative, and this same logic applies to that case. Now, uh, information-centric networking does give caching a more prominent role and increased relevance, as you have every node operating as an intermediate cache device in your network. And uh, there are several solutions that can be applied to ICN, uh, ranging from implicit cache coordination, which is what we tackle, explicit cache coordination, which requires additional information exchange, uh, chunk level coordination, which is something that's unique, to, uh, that's more, that's fit from ICN, which means that because you have name data, you can more reliably split your content into chunks and then do cache operations based on chunks. And uh, as well as predictive and preemptive caching, mobility aware, adaptive, and social caching. All of those are dependent on mobility patterns and communication patterns, which uh, require additional <coughs> coordination as well or additional knowledge of that. Now, indeed, we do have multiple, te multiple te caching techniques that can be applied, and many of them who were inherited from physical editing. And uh, because we have more uh, in-network caching, that's a good thing. However, uh, these approaches have limitations in terms of how much coordination or how much interaction with infrastructure services that they need. And these are made worse by the limitations that we have in that net environment, which is uh, lossy, uh, bursty, and uh, highly prone to changes in the network connectivity structure. Now, because most solutions are based on infrastructure-centric or infrastructure-dependent cache management, either in terms of coordination or acquiring uh, synchronization information, or either to position your cache copies at, your, at the edge of your network, that's, that's not great for vehicle, vehicle networks, especially because you have a lot of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle services that do not necessarily require connection to the internet, but that can be just sent from one vehicle to another in, within the network. And um, because infrastructure deployment is costly and uh, infrastructure access is costly, if you look at mobile connections to infrastructure, there's a high price for that and there's high demand, which means that you'll, might, you might also even face uh, access restrictions if everyone is connected to it all the time, especially if you are transferring video, for example, on multiple services that require constant connection between the vehicles. Now, uh, the conclusion is, is that we need, is that there are uh, significant opportunities in terms of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity uh, solutions for ICN vendors. And because uh, of these limitations in infrastructure, we consider that implicit cache coordination that can be performed directly within vehicles, as well as uh, relative as chunk level caching, uh, those are both, those are very good fits. And there are words in chunk level caching uh, but there isn't really anything relating to implicit cache coordination for ICN vendors. Now, if you just look at some of the implicit policies that are uh, that can, you, can, you can insert into ICN, so you have a cache everything everywhere policy where you are always going to be caching your content, or a leave copy down policy in which you just leave a copy uh, from one step away from your content producer to distributed probabilistic where you try to place content closer to your content uh, requester as well as relative probability or just never cache policies. Uh, the one issue is that uh, this distribution placement of your cache copies are asymmetrical and there is no necessary, there's, there's not necessarily any correlation between the locations of your content requests, which means that this is not very good in terms of optimizing content placement in the caches. Now, so we consider this context. In face of limited network resources and limited access to infrastructure services, um, how can a VTD communication and ICN be improved by caching? Well, we focus uh, to, our focus on solving this is in defining a cache policy designed to increase global net probability and uh, with limited impact of distance 
and potential content servers, we try to make our caches as efficient as possible in, as a group, as a, at a network level. And to do this, we have cooperative cache replacement scheme that's aided by some information that's provided by content servers. <coughs> so it's local awareness based on their perspective of how frequently objects are requested. And our approach based on this is to implement, sorry, is to implement a popularity-based estimation uh, that is used within our utility gradient uh, scheme called uh, utility gradient cache or UG cache. Now, our solution uh, attempts to distribute uh, the probability of an object being copied uh, more symmetrically in the network. So you might have copies in the middle of, of your uh, return route. So uh, from ICN, what you have is you have interest propagation and when you have a uh, server that can fulfill those requests, you have a return path. And what we want is we want to distribute these more evenly in our return paths. And we also want to do that based on our knowledge of whether the item is actually useful or not uh, for the network, if it's relevant or if it's unlikely to be requested again. And we can do that uh, faster or slower. These are two things that we'd like to control. Uh, so, uh, in, so the speed would affect uh, how frequently and how quickly an item would be placed in a cache in the middle of the network. Now, uh, so we do use an NDN-based communication model and where we have interest propagation and our nodes maintain their re relative request frequencies in their uh, caches as a uh, secondary table that's as long as the content stores. And incoming requests available locally do increase <coughs> with a visit. So whenever you have a request that has a local hit, you do increase the request frequency table. And uh, to manage our frequency tables, we do operate them as sliding windows, one uh, vector for each for each content object that's stored locally. And uh, we know that because caches have to operate at line speed, that you do have limited cache sizes, and so that's uh, that's okay and that uh, intermediate noder, nodes, when they are in the return path and they have the content response coming through them, that they filter uh, the content object in terms of whether they should store this content in their own cache or not, uh, depending on their local storage state, as well as the event data that's received from the return path from the service that we're sending information to them. And uh, one of the variables that we sent, uh, we sent a distance less cache which is done in terms of uh, hop count in between cache operations, as well as the uh, request count for objects. So if you have a, if you perform a content replacement, the request count for that object will also be inserted into your table. Now, uh, so we considered uh, frequency distribution to do that, and there is a disparity between what a local, no, uh, what a node would like locally, and what is best for the network. Obviously, if you do a highest frequency at every node, that means that locally you would have very high chance of caching what you want, but that means that you have a very low uh, cache diversity, which means that for less popular objects, that you would have a very long uh, path to traverse in order to find someone that has an actual object. And uh, implicitly coordinated content distribution based on popularity mitigates that, and increase, increases cache variety without uh, favoring a specific node because nodes are operating on their the personal knowledge as well as something that's relative to the network as uh, communication as a whole. And uh, so that means that everyone is trying to gain, gain a little bit for themselves, but as well trying to make the network a more even playing field so that everyone can uh, reduce their average hop count to content. Now, uh, naturally, if you're just want to have everyone share their cache information and try to figure out how's the best placement. Well, that's a non colonial problem, and it introduces a lot of overhead. And so that's something that you try to avoid. And to solve this issue, we're, we're just going to try to use content distribution patterns to evaluate content popularity and how to, to define our equations. And in our work, we consider uh, power distribution. We consider a zip-like zip distribution in our modeling and analysis. And uh, for the definition of UG cache, we also consider a lambda distance factor, which defines the effect of distance in item utility, so how relevant it is for a cache inclusion. And uh, assigning higher values to lambda does increase the likelihood that an item will be cached. 
and, in, and increase the diversity because we'll have more replacements at the cost of having uh, items with smaller frequencies being added to caches. We also have a distance since last catch, which is uh, also a variable that's returned in the return path. <coughs> And that's updated every hop count, regardless of a cache operation occurring or not. And you also have the request count for the object at a remote node. And uh, by providing the request count and relative frequency, we can estimate the popularity of a content object and determine its potential for inclusion in their caches. And because uh, more, uh, more popular items, they have uh, a larger sample size of requests, this is functional for uh, objects that are more popular. And as they become less popular, e even though you might have degradation in how much you can perceive that these items are going to be being requested, they're not as relevant, so that's okay. That's not a big issue. And so this is our item utility function. Um, we also define a variant of it, which we call minimum uh, gradient cache. And we, done, we do this to provide a more ample uh, comparison with, to, to our work and to make it more general. And in this, instead of having uh, evaluating the individual probability of each item in your local cache, what you do is, is you just have the relative frequency of the least requested item to use in your utility function. So MG cache is designed to increase cache diversity even further by increasing the likelihood that an item is eligible for cache. And uh, so this is the equation for it. It's the minimum probability within your local cache. And uh, while we do not specifically enforce any cache eviction policy that you might want to apply with our work, we do consider uh, uh, least frequently used eviction policy as we have information on access statistics. Now, to evaluate uh, how UG cache works and how NG cache works, we considered a probability match function that's based on the zip flight distribution and that we use to model uh, request frequency. Well, we note that in our evaluation, we do consider a uh, restriction. So for this, we just have the hope value set to one. And uh, from this, we can evaluate the content availability. And we do this initially for a library of 2,000 objects. So <clears throat> uh, additional comments just before we get to the uh, evaluation. Now, in terms of implementing this, uh, utility value only has to be calculated whenever there is a cache operation. So if there's a cache hit, the local cache utility uh, values, they have to be updated. And when there's a cache replacement, if you have an item list of, that's eligible for caching, the local fun utility function also needs to be updated, but that can be kept, uh, so the, the values can be kept uh, for incoming operations. And uh, they can maintain it synchronously because uh, they are not really dependent on any specific uh, operation other than an incoming request and uh, they're they don't require a lot of type of complexity because a lookup and comparison times can be done within a table just using uh, a login if you have a sorted list based on the utility of the objects in the list and um, even uh, all, uh, the order linear time is order of one if you have if you're doing the minimum utility replacement because we only have to compare with the least relevant object in your list. Now, uh, when you're evaluating uh, cache insertion, we did that in terms of cache sizes. Now, you can see that uh, as increases in hop, so we have the x-axis uh, distance in hops between a node and a node further down the return path. And uh, in the y-axis, the maximum viable range. So counting from one, which is the highest frequency object in your uh, popular distribution to the least, uh, starting from rank one, uh, you see that there is an increase in the viability of objects in terms of whether they can be cached or not. And this is seen from a global knowledge standpoint. And uh, what we see is that increases in cache sizes have increased, increasingly limited effect in the increase of, of rank viability. That is because as items become less popular, the number of items that have that same frequency uh, increase significantly, and which means that there's kind of a cap in how many items are rather eligible for our caching. And you see that we have up to four times the size of the cache eligible for inclusion. And that uh, increasing your cache size does have a benefit, but it's a rather limited one. 
and uh, that obviously forces you to have a bigger cache, which is also a limiting factor because we're trying to have line speed operation. Now we also consider uh, cache insertion in terms of the lambda factor, uh, and we see uh, that it has a similar behavior to that of increasing cache size, but it's controllable. So for lambda uh, equal to one, you have the top 250 candidate objects with the highest uh, frequencies, being responsible for up to 75% of the repressed probability, which is good. And for lambda to four, you have up to 850 atoms out of 2,000 items with 89% hit probability. So uh, it's similar to that in terms of how uh, increasing your variability increases the, 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 the chance that an item is eligible, but it's programmatically, and you can control that from within your environment. And uh, just on a note, nodes are deployed, uh, so and, and they have partial knowledge and limited caches, which means that their perception is more skewed. And what that ends up being is that uh, items are more eligible to be included in caches, but that can be compensated by changing the lambda value. Now, we also did some simulation evaluation to see how this would work, and we evaluate EG cache and MG cache against existing implicit cache policies that are applicable to iScan Bennett's, and we have selected uh, cache everything, everywhere, ever cache, and distance probabilistic against uh, UG cache and MG cache. We also can include two variants where instead of nodes, of uh, nodes having to compute the distribution and the, the relevance factor of objects locally, we rely on global knowledge. So we assume that there's an option where there's infrastructure connected or some God node connected. And the God node knows the uh, ranking of each item that's going to the cache so they can for the calculations with uh, the correct value, with the absolute values terms of item probability. Uh, we selected a simulation environment that's been used by our research lab a few times before. Uh, we have some work uh, on it. And essentially, for this, we set the zip exponent uh, hope to 0 0.8, and we have a lot of 15,000 items divided into three categories. And our caches can hold up to 6 to 50 items. And we set our distance factor lambda to 1. Uh, we did some preliminary evaluation and found that uh, lambda value set to one would suffice. <coughs> now, so uh, we have some very interesting results. We can see that the application of MG cache, which is the more flexible approach, leads to an increase of up to 25% to delivery rates, and UG cache up to 70% when compared to the never cache option, and 15 80% relative to distribution probabilistic. And uh, unlike alternate approaches, uh, cache inclusion is dependent on utility. So that means that you have increased cache hit ratios. Uh, that's further denoted by the increase in the global MG cache approach. And uh, this strongly suggests the need for information dissemination of the network. And as you can see here, uh, the global UG cache doesn't perform as well because it's using absolute knowledge. And that means that it doesn't do as many cache uh, replacements, so there's less variability, and that means that you have to traverse a longer path to, to try to find your content, and you might not because vehicular networks can sometimes be, uh, they are prone to uh, intermittent connectivity, and so you might not be able to connect to a server, or you might have a long path, you might be disconnected in your route, or a whole bunch of, of other different possibilities. Uh, we also look at the total cache replacements that we have from our policies, and naturally you see that cache everything everywhere performs the most replacements, followed by the, by the global uh, MG cache. But as we can see from the previous results, uh, MG, the global variant of MG cache does have here a, a, an increased uh, content delivery amount, uh, which is because we are caching the better items, let's say, the items with the higher request probability. And uh, similarly, our global UG cache has the smallest number of uh, cache replacements almost close to that of never because it only caches uh, items that increase the the local probability. Uh, lastly, uh, we note that we have a small increase in latency in terms of communications. And uh, what happens is for UG cache global specifically, because there are infrequent replacements, uh, if 
the content is found, it's going to be everywhere. And if it's everywhere, you're going to have a higher chance of fetching it. Uh, so you might have a, a little bit longer distance to travel to find uh, in, in any other scenario. But uh, the, dif the differences are minimum, and they are well worth the, the result of the, the, the cost, right? Now, lastly, uh, we have some configurations in future work. Now, in this work, we introduced uh, two caching policies, and uh, UG cache and its derivative MG cache, based on a utility function derived from popularity and distributing nodes. The proposed UG cache and its variant MG cache allow for increased content delivery in real world scenarios with no need for additional con communication, which is one of the important things that we want from an ad hoc variable network, a uh, limitation in terms of our overhead. And uh, numerical and simulation based evaluation denoted the usefulness of utility estimation and valid social coordination for cache management. Those solutions proposed require little additional overhead just in terms of the content that's added to the actual response messages. No additional messages are required. And they introduce uh, into ISK Invented a useful feature uh, in terms of popularity based schemes that can be incorporated to most solutions without the need of changes. Um, we also have a lot of future work. Uh, we'd like to implement a locality-dependent uh, popularity model. We have uh, a lot of social media geotech information that we have from our laboratory that we could to get using here. And an ultimate popularity estimation scheme that takes into consideration unfulfilled requests because uh, ICN nodes always have their pending interest table. We'd like to take advantage of information that's being stored in the information table, uh, from historical information, to try to see if we can improve the accuracy of our of the evaluation of popularity, and uh, and the mechanisms to dynamically adjust lambda based on on delivery rates. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ali Pell. Take your questions. We have time for one or two quick <coughs> questions. Where is the location of this cache? Is it located? Uh, is it locally located, like in the vehicle where the request is generated, or is it on other vehicles? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, as part of uh, CCN design, each node uh, within their own like router, they have three components. They have a, their content store, which is a local cache that participates in the communication process for, for all incoming requests, as well as the PIT, depending. Interest table and the forward information base. So yes, every node uh, does have their own cache, and that's why uh, cache operations can occur at every node in the network. So that's the reason why you didn't consider mobility, right? Well, we should consider mobility. All nodes are mobile in the network. No, no, because you didn't mention that which kind of mobility pattern you are using or anything like that. Okay, so um, that's that's a very relevant factor. Um, so if in this work we continue that the work that we did in previous uh, previous papers. And we described that in more depth in, in, in the work I've done in the past because that's been, been validated. But essentially, we designed our mobility patterns to follow those of the real world. So we did a lot of local evaluation of our network, and we got information and, and, and implemented uh, mobility patterns to replicate those. We, we had a lot of heat maps evaluating everything. And um, so we used that scenario but everything is done ad hoc. Any more quick questions? Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, to pick up on the previous question, are you considering uh, RSUs as well to be uh, the expectation? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so we do not consider RSUs, though they can be added to the network as additional nodes that are stationary, essentially. Yeah, for backup. Uh, yes, yes, for backup. Uh, we don't because we want the solution to be as flexible and as independent from any additional resources that would be required. And we see that uh, adding RSUs is interesting, but it's something that's not happening right now, right? We generally just have people to do communications, and because there's added costs to it. Um, but but they, they're probably not Use them as a yes, yes, of course, of course. As we can do for infrastructure devices to connect to 5G, for example, we can use them to store additional information. Um, but we, what we wanted to was focus on V2V communication only for this case. Do you do the dynamic 
So yes, uh, dynamic tuning of Lambda is a future work, and as of now, we have evaluated it with different uh, uh, parameters, like different values to Lambda, and we have chosen that the values uh, one or two, which are uh, less uh, anticipated in terms of content replacement, are the more efficient. We present the results for one, because uh, of the way how, how the distribution is 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 formatted. So if you have a distribution that is uh, that is less skewed, then it would be interesting to increase the value of lambda. But that's dependent on the distribution, and that's why it's a future work. We'd like to correlate that to the frequency distribution of content objects. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't call you back from lunch, so can you join me to thank the presenter again? Thank you very much.